Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I believe this is now live. Um, my name is Matt, and today we're going to be talking about strategy in the context of debating. Um, obviously, this is live, so there is a chat box thing. Um, and if you have any questions at any time, then please do, uh, you know, use that feature and I will try and keep an eye on it as I go through the workshop. So what is strategy? Um, this sounds kind of banal, but I think it is important. I think sometimes people think of strategy in terms of very specific things what is the best extension to use in this scenario? Or if Open and Gov say this thing and then opening up say that thing, what should I say as closing off in order to win the debate? I think it is more useful to think of strategy in terms of a broader picture that applies to more or less every decision you make in debating. Um, because I think one thing that sometimes we one thing that we sometimes forget in debating is that this isn't really, as much as we might like to pretend, the activity whereby we strive for, you know, to be the most intellectually honest and the best, most clever, most wonderful arguments always win. More often than not, what wins is just teams who have learned to play the game very well. Because realistically, that's all debating is. It's just a game whereby we talk past each other. No one really knows what they're talking about. We only have, you know, seven minutes or so to actually come up with anything clever. We have to come up with that thing from scratch. And so there's nothing anyone can really prove beyond any reasonable doubt inside seven minutes that another equally competent team can't rebut and say is completely wrong or irrelevant, et cetera. So in actuality, I think the overwhelming majority of debates are not won um, on the quality of argumentation that any one team delivers. I think they're one on the basis of which, how the arguments that were given fit together. And I think this is something that the more judging you do, the more clear it will become to you. Increasingly, I think people find when they are being judged as they get more competent at debating and are generally getting better at all the basics, they'll start to hear things like, uh, that just wasn't relevant or they'll ask a judge oh was there anything wrong with my analysis and the judge will say well not really because there wasn't um it was just a case of things like argument selection things like not engaging properly the other side so strategy is basically the recognition that debating bp in particular is a game it has particular rules and there are particular things that we can do to hedge against losing uh, and to try and win the game better. So what I thought could be talked about um, in this session, first of all, just the kind of basics of strategic argumentation. Um, so what do we mean by this? I think I, I, I've said it before, um, and I think it is true that many debates are won or lost in prep time. Um, and what I mean by that is that teams will go into a debate thinking that you, you can go into a debate with a bunch of arguments that are just deeply irrelevant to the debate that's happening. And then as soon as you know, you're know OO and as soon as OG start talking, you realize you've made a huge mistake and then you force there and then. So the first way to kind of hedge against losing the game um, is to ensure that all of your arguments are incredibly relevant to the round at hand. Um, and I think the way you do this is by working backwards. So we, we all learn, at, you know, as soon as we were starting out and debating really that any debate, any set of arguments you want to bring um, should always be framed in terms of burdens. What are you trying to prove? And I think this is something that people sort of start when they first learn how to debate, they, they think about this in these terms, but they're not very good at it. And then once they get better, they start jumping straight ahead to being, okay, what are the clever arguments we can make here? And I think actually, um, if you want to improve, you need to 
almost go back to basics and be very careful about the arguments that you're choosing to make and whether they do fulfill those very basic burdens that are put upon you. So um, to pick a motion, let's suggest we had a motion which is something like, um, okay, I did this one very recently. Uh, the, this house will pay reparations to women. Also, incidentally, the um, the Galway year is final. Um, and let's say for argument's sake, uh, we're open to government in this debate. Now, I think, well, the first thing is, regardless of what team you are in the debate, I think this is one thing that people often skip in their prep time, regardless of whether I'm OG, OO, CGC, or whatever, I think the first thing to do is just to, to stop and think for a little while about what this debate actually is about for both sides. What is the territory this debate is going to be fought on? Because in the overwhelming majority of debates, both teams are going to care about approximately the same set of issues to approximately the same extent. They're going to agree on most things. They're just going to differ slightly in terms of how we achieve those things or whether a, a particular slant to achieving those things is better or worse than the other. So the first thing you have to work out in any debate is what are the very narrow set of issues that this debate is actually going to be decided on. So um, in this debate, for, for example, clearly both teams are going to broadly agree that there is a there are a lot of harms that have been done to women in the past and that many of those harms are likely to persist to this day in terms of, of, uh, of the pay gap, etc. So if you're an open government team, while it is worthwhile spending time flagging this up and saying here are some of the reasons why we owe reparations to women because of historic disadvantage and the way those continue to this day, it is extremely unlikely that the other side is going to stand up and say uh, no, actually, we think, you know, everything is totally fine and dandy. And there's no particular reason why women have been harmed in the past or are particularly harmed today. So we don't want to do this. So it is useful sort of rhetorically to establish that as a baseline, but I don't think it's something that is worth spending a lot of time on because in British parliamentary debating, uh, Euros, you're only going to have 40 minutes uh, of time to talk, you're going to have to do a bunch of rebuttal, you're going to have to probably spend a bunch of that dealing with POIs and faffing, etc. on your introduction, your conclusion. So you don't actually have that much time in order to make arguments. And I think the way a lot of judges think about arguments is that they, you know, as much as we would like them to, often judges will not think, it's, it's just impossible to hold in your mind every single word in a you know 56 minute long BP debate that every single team says. It's impossible for a judge to hold every single one of those words in their head simultaneously. It's impossible for them to think about every single level of analysis and every single example and sub point that you have. So they're gonna already have some intuitions in terms of broad strokes. So you don't wanna lose the judge by just talking about something that the judge thinks is kind of irrelevant or allows the other team to get away with some like witty one-liners that push you out. So don't spend lots of time on the obvious uh, things that are not contested. Rather, you then want to spend the, thing, the large amounts of time on things that are likely to be contested. And the best way to work out what those grounds are likely to be is to think about what are the other side going to say. So in, uh, the, the the reparations debate, say you're opening government, you can sit there and you think, look, both sides probably can agree we need to we want to help women in some way. We're gonna say that this is a particularly good way to help women, and we're gonna construct a bunch of reasons why that is. Um, but what is OP gonna say? Why is OP gonna say giving a load of money to women is a bad thing? Uh, and then you start thinking through th things from there. You think of what are the sort of the obvious um sort of ballparks that OP can make. So they can make a bunch of claims about how other um, groups might be more deserving of this money. And then you think, okay, are there ways we can preemptively structure our case to deal with this? Can, is it legitimate for us to say we should probably just pay reparations to everyone? Um, you know, we should pay reparations to other communities that have been similarly disadvantaged. If you don't want to go down that route, then you're at your first kind of strategic decision point, which is to say, okay, so we need to have 
somewhere in our case a justification that says we are totally fine with giving money to women even those women who might be less structurally disadvantaged than say um a, a, a poor man from a racial minority or a uh a, a, a sexual minority or something like that something that says we are totally fine with giving money in that regard or you might want to try and think about ways you can diminish the power of this argumentation by uh hedging against it in your model so you could say something like uh we will allow women to opt out or maybe these reparations would be means tested or they will be paid through a progressive income tax such that very rich women would probably be paying more in the extra income tax that we're kind of sticking on top of this uh, than they would be actually getting back in terms of like a handout or however it is you want to make it. So early on in prep time, you want to be thinking what are the main areas that OPPA are going to contest? How can we make sure that our arguments exist on those grounds? So opposition can't stand up and say, Ah, we just kind of agree with this bit, but we disagree with the very last bit. Other plausible arguments um, that opposition uh, could make is, I think, you know, a pretty plausible, this will harm our ability to do other nice things uh, for, for women, like, uh, like quotas or just kind of generally ensuring they are paid better uh, in the workplace. And that or those things are more important than these things. So that kind of requires you on prop to again in your argumentation hedge against this. Probably in by hedging against both of those things, the first thing will be an explanation, which is probably implicit in most of your constructive, but you might just want to flag it explicitly that says, we just think raw cash money is probably the best way to emancipate women. So even if this slightly hinders progress in some other respects, uh, we just think the significant benefit of giving huge numbers of women large amounts of money to make them no longer financially dependent on men or to free them up for political advocacy, which will enable them to campaign better to fix some of the, the, the things that OP are gonna say are more important that people will listen to less. So you hedge against it in that regard. Uh, and then I think you also just say, no, actually, there is no particular reason why this is going to make things like quotas harder to achieve. And you think of some fun reasons why that might be the case. Maybe it's because you're giving a load of women a load of money and they're going to use these, you use this money um, such that they can uh, lobby politically or donate it to particular women's rights organizations, or maybe it's just going to, you know, if, if men are going to be paying a whole extra load of income tax specifically to pay for this um, reparation handout, then it probably just makes more sense if you're a man and woman in a, in a couple of approximately equal earning potential for the woman to be the primary breadwinner, because she is not going to be hit by this extra tax uh, for, for to pay for these reparations. So maybe in the long run, there'll be more women working in, you know, taking like long, having longer and better careers, which means they achieve positions of power. So then when they're hiring, they're more likely to hire women, yada, yada, yada. So generally what I'm saying here is that the way we just go about constructing our arguments, any position on the table, this is how you do it for opening, it's obviously slightly different for closing, always should be informed in the light of what you think the most likely set of arguments the other side is going to make are. Uh, because that will ensure that you are incredibly relevant all the way to the end. Often you might find that if you're an opening team and you make a set of arguments that is some more peripheral to what other people are expecting the debate to be about, then as the debate goes on, you slowly find yourself becoming less and less relevant. And then unfortunately you take a third or a fourth and you think, well, I thought my arguments were good. Uh, so I don't really know what the problem was. And then afterwards things like, well, as the debate went on, you just became less relevant or, well, lots of really good arguments were made in closing half uh, and their arguments stood better to the end of the debate and there was more clash over those arguments, which is like, I 
sometimes lazy judging, but also sometimes just fair and reasonable judging. If your arguments are irrelevant to the clash that is happening, there's no particular reason why, no matter how brilliantly you make those, uh, they should count more in the debate. So I guess the next question then is, how do I work out what the sort of likely things the other side are going to say are? I think, so the first thing is that probably just doing more debating, as unhelpful as it sounds, will probably just get you a better intuition of these things. I think it is just true that a lot of debating takes place along a relatively narrow set of social issues because we're all taught that we should argue from first principles and we shouldn't kind of already start assuming a set of knowledge. It means that lots of people make very similar arguments. Um, a lot of IR debates have pretty stock analysis depending on where you are. Someone will make the inevitable Trump argument or the China North Korea argument or something about Russia and Putin being a strong man. Like uh, just over time you will realize that people are just, no one in debating is as clever as they, they present themselves to be. And they're just gonna say the same things that about 20 other much cleverer people than them have said before. Um, oh, someone has a question. Okay, come back to that. Um, the second, perhaps more helpful way is to think about what the purpose of the debate is. So if it's a policy motion, um, and let's say it's something like building social housing in traditionally wealthy areas, um, think of kind of like, well, like, what is the actual reason why any normal human being would do this policy in real life? You can think about it in terms of the actors. So here, we're, you know, presumably the aim of this policy or the thing that both sides want to achieve is that um, those living in social housing, those who don't have lots of money, lots of political opportunity, have better lives. And Prop are gonna say that the way to have these, give these people better lives is to build houses for them to live in that are in neighborhoods that are traditionally more wealthy. And Op are gonna say the inverse is true. So then you can kind of go through from there and say, okay, so more or less every argument that either side will make probably has an inverse. So Gulf will say, living in these wealthy areas is good because you have access to good services. And then you think, okay, well, what are reasonable opposition responses to this? They could say, uh, maybe they will be priced out of those services. Maybe they will feel social pressure to not use those services because they don't feel like they they have a place there um there is a you know arguments about um the interaction between socioeconomic status and race and policies that traditionally we would expect people from more wealthy backgrounds that are often like live in neighborhoods that are you know like 90 percent white or 99 100 percent white are often much more in favor of a, things like stop and search or aggressive policing tactics. It's probably an argument on prop that says when you mix these two communities together, maybe there'll be better like cross community dialogue and these sorts of policies that, you know, in debating both people are going to say are bad, are likely to be reduced. Op then says the inverse, which is no, 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 no these people will interact more. And then that means that when there are bad incidents, they feel much more proximate. Like now the bad incidents are happening, not on the other side of the town, uh, but actually in your neighborhood. So you're going to be more in favor of these things. So often most arguments are just kind of relatively symmetric. Um, so I think you should just at the start of your prep time, put yourself in the shoes of the other side and go, what are the kind of general main burdens that we need to prove or not in order to win this debate? What are some likely arguments that we might make? And then use that to inform what you're going to say on prop. One thing I would say, sort of trap to avoid, is I have seen one speaker who has long since become very, very good at debating, uh, but they, they used to do, they used to, they, they kind of heard this advice and what they did was, they would spend the first five minutes of prep, like aggressively brainstorming and almost prepping an entire case for the other side. And then would prep rebuttal responses to what the other side is going to say. I don't think this is helpful. 
because you know chances are they probably just won't say the things you think they're going to say if you prep it that extensively the idea here is not to prep okay if i was going to give an lo speech what would i say what would my frame be my counter prop what arguments would i make what examples would i use but generally what kind of where does the sort of argumentative battlefield in this debate actually lie so you could force yourself to be ruthlessly on clash um so um that's what i would say is important in terms of um argumentative strategy in terms of deciding which arguments you're going to use and Lots of the ways in which we have good strategy are also just true of how we generally have good and relevant arguments. And there have been other workshops on this. I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but this is just things like, you know, if you're struggling for how to generate the most strategically relevant argumentation, just think, you know, who are the most relevant people in this debate? Who are the people who are most strongly affected by this debate, who lack the means to change their situation in other forms? Um, so th that those sort of steps that you would normally go when you're when you're brainstorming um and the next part is on sort of given that a bunch of arguments have probably been made uh responses rebuttal how what is the strategic approach to rebuttal um so in a debate a lot of people are going to say a lot of things, like more things than it is reasonable for anyone to expect you to respond to. If you're deputy prime minister, then you've only had seven minutes of, of talk to respond to, but you need to respond to their responses to your prime minister's material. You need to respond to their case. You also need to make some additional substantive contributions. Um, similarly, uh, but it only gets worse from there. If you get to sort of opposition member you've already had like what 35 minutes of debating before you and you want to make a strong substantive additional impact so you just literally do not have enough time to rebut everything in the debate so the question then is what should you prioritize and i think often people prioritize the wrong things so things you should definitely not prioritize are things that you think are particularly easy to rebut or things where you think they have relied on an, you know, they, they're arguing through the use of examples and you think their examples are bad uh, because obviously they'll just pick a different example. Um, things you definitely should rebut. Um, so the first thing that is obviously really important to rebut is if they have made any responses to your partner's substantive material. Uh, this is obviously only relevant if you're the second speaker in, in it in a team so no matter how good or bad you think their responses are it is always important to demonstrate to the judges that you yourself are responding to the responses that are given um so you need to rebuild anything that needs rebuilding obviously the amount of time you spend on this will depend on the amount of time they spend on it so if they only had one or two pithy one-liners to your case point out that they only had one or two pithy one-liners to your case. Again, a lot of debating is just about judges' intuitions and their and kind of how they're generally feeling about these things. Often, I think judges form opinions about teams and uh, and arguments without like before they've actually really thought about the exact minutia of what any team has said. They will just kind of be like, "Yeah, they didn't really respond to them," um, and so pointing that out can be helpful like do the kind of the performative aspects of debating which is you know when you flag up say they didn't respond to our argument they only made these one or two responses but i'm going to respond to them anyway to play the game and so that has the added benefit of signaling to the judge that you know what you should be doing but also reminding the judge that their responses were pretty uh non-existent then obviously you should respond to them and this is where we say things like it's important to take in to consideration the best case possible responses. Um, what we mean by this is that you know you might make a an argument and the other side has sort of a, res a kind of quite a flimsy response to parts of it. That's like, well, isn't it true that in this circumstance that is not applicable? Um, and you say, well, like 
I think a stronger argument that they could have made or a stronger response they could have made would be to say this is never applicable because of, you know, the reasons they gave in their example are actually generalizable to all cases. And then you explain why you think that isn't true. So responding to the best case. Um, in terms of what you should respond to from their case, you need to prioritize. I think you need to prioritize by thinking argumentatively which arguments they have made are the most important and most relevant in this round. So um, if, for example, we're doing the reparations debate and you were deputy prime minister and opening up spent a lot of time saying, you know, some people have worked really hard for this money and now we're taxing it and giving it to women and lots of women will just use it for frivolous things like um, just buying themselves, I don't know, a new TV or whatever, or a dog or something. Um, uh, and so it's unfair that we're just giving, taking away hot people's hard earned money and giving it to women who are just going to use it on things which don't necessarily better themselves or their situation. And that's just bad. Um, and so when we think about this, I think what you need to think about is not rebutting the claim that people might use this money on frivolous things. I think you flip it and say, yep, yeah, maybe some women will just buy themselves a bunch of TVs or paintings or, I don't know, a nice coffee maker or whatever it is. But it's entirely legitimate that they do so and we would actively encourage them to do so because these are the kind of things that like women are less able to do or have been structurally shut out from doing because they have less money so they have to prioritize it on like more basic fundamental goods, whatever. So flipping that argumentation around rather than responding to each and every nitty gritty claim within it. The second thing is to just, if they make arguments that are just kind of wildly irrelevant to the round, it is useful to have one or two responses, but your first response should always be, this seems wildly irrelevant, so I'm not going to spend very much time on it. And if you explain why you think it's irrelevant, then that can be just as powerful a piece of rebuttal as actually finding direct logical refutations to the analysis contained within their argument. I think oftentimes some of the most effective rebuttal is just pointing out that you're not going to bother rebutting their argument because you don't need to. Um, that said, one piece of strategic advice is that I think it's always useful to hedge in this scenario. That is to say, um, if you think an argument is irrelevant, then say that it is irrelevant. Explain why you think it's irrelevant, but don't just stop there. Also then do a kind of, well, like, but even if this is relevant to the round, uh, and even if it is an issue that women are just going to spend all this money on whatever, uh, like Xbox games, then here is why we think it is actually less likely that they will do, and they're much more likely to spend these things on things like improving themselves economically or donating to political parties, whatever. So you do the classic, even if your argument is irrelevant for reasons A, B, and C, but on the case that it is relevant, here is why it is wrong, or it doesn't really matter, or it is like tangential at best, affects a very small number of people, we should not care about it. All of the standard rebuttal responses, always useful to do both of those things. Generally, I prefer doing them in the order of why it's irrelevant first, why it's wrong second, although obviously um, you could do it in different ways. Um, in terms of understanding what the clash is, so there's a, there's a question someone's asked which says, do you have any tips on how to build structure or, or how to build slash structure your points when you're facing messy slash bad debates? How do you find the clash in bad debates? This is an interesting question. Um, so I think the first thing you can attempt to do is Im impose your own structure on the debate based on what you think teams were trying to do. But I think often very messy and bad debates come about because teams are just talking about 20 different issues at once, but they kind of say that they're doing it for a particular reason. Or they say, we're going to tell you about the most important thing in the debate, which is this issue, uh, like how um, 
you know, poor working class men will respond to this politically. And then they have a bunch of arguments that like sometimes are relevant to it, sometimes aren't relevant to it. So you can impose your own structure by saying, you know, what, by kind of telling the judges that team was trying to make this set of arguments. Uh, we're going to respond to the absolute best case of that scenario. So you kind of recognize that they've done a, a shoddy job of proving a particular point, but you say, let's assume that they had given us loads of really good reasons why actually the result of this policy would be that large numbers of uh, poor working class men would unionize and would vote for policies and do things that are generally bad for women. Here are all of our responses to that. The second thing you can do is, and I think you should probably just be doing this anyway, and this is something I would encourage everyone to do. This is obviously particularly important if you're a closing half team, is that you should be trying to sort of judge and or flow as the Americans call it, the debate as it happens. So what you might do, and this doesn't need to be, so you don't need to do this in super detail. So as an example, let's say you're like closing gov or whatever, uh, just like have a piece of paper next to all your other notes where you're writing things down, whether you're an extension speaker or not, just with like the classic little like this thing on it, like little four boxes. Um, and then just kind of write down a few lines for what OG is saying. So listen to the prime minister, listen to their model, write down like one or two lines that just say this was their model. They say, my first argument is gonna be this. Write down what they say their first argument was gonna be. And then as they go through anything particularly important that interacts with your case, because they're talking about similar things, or you think they have missed logical links, write those down and make a mental note of those because that will be important later. Do that for the opposition team as well. And then think about where those two things interact. Have the teams just talk completely past each other or are there some arguments that interact with each other? Generally, if a debate is incredibly messy, one of the strongest things you can do as a, you know, if you're a closing half team, the first thing I would suggest is just be deeply unmessy. Pick like one or maybe two things in extension, say this debate is just about this one issue and then talk about that for 15 minutes. 14 minutes um, and add in like some stuff about like, well, the top half was kind of really messy and there was this clash, like, you know, will this lead to better political rights for women or worse political rights for women? Actually, this debate is about this one thing, which is about how this will result in people, I don't know, say, oh, you know, this will be an incredibly strong signaler for people to pay women less using the current structure where although formally illegal women are still paid disproportionately less through lots of soft mechanisms like not being promoted or hired for things and this kind of subconscious bias is going to impede women in the workplace and the amount of reparations money that they're going to get is going to be much smaller than if they had actually got that promotion that they were entitled to that they're now not going to get and you just say debate is about one issue often an issue that you can kind of flip from the other side. So you say, look, all of Gov's benefits come from the idea that this is going to result in women having more money and are they therefore able to access a bunch of things, be it stuff, be it political rights, be it whatever. We're going to say women get less money on Gov's side because of these two reasons or like that's kind of the general claim, then you have some reasons supporting it. And by being very clear, very structured, making sure that all of your arguments are well explained and are relevant and placed in debate, that is how you can kind of step above the mess. Even if, so if, if, if you feel like you just cannot impose any kind of reasonable structure on what has gone before you in the debate, the idea then is to step outside it and say like, well, it doesn't matter. And I think this is the next thing, part of strategy, is kind of strategy in terms of extension um, how you decide what like extension material you should run, generally what sorts of things are useful to run. I think a really, probably the best example of like just ruthless strategy winning a debate I've ever seen is the, uh, the Zagreb Euros final. Um, 
and this is a motion words to the effect of uh, the feminist movement should like always be pacifist basically or should oppose interventions that aren't specifically to help women or something like that um and so opening gov run a pretty solid case about how you know we have a principal duty as feminists to be non-violent and how often intervention uh, often the, the people who are harmed the most as a result of conflict whether just or not are women and so this you know means there'll be lots of harm to women in these scenarios where we do intervene and therefore we ought not do it and we should have a normative stance of saying we will never uh, support uh, intervention and opening up says more or less the inverse which is um, that actually there are interventions where it's incredibly necessary and that uh, lots of these things are things that women should definitely care about and the feminist movement ought to care about and violence is justified in certain scenarios and we can be like to a degree somewhat discerning in which interventions we do or do not support and so there's a big clash in opening half about whether the feminist movement ought be um like ought be uh pacifist is something we should care about our own and closing guard is is more of the same and kind of in gives some more reasons why i think from memory like what why we think this is actually likely to meaningfully change some things and then closing up just come in and almost win the debate with a with a series of very sensible observations and it is just clever strategy so what they say is look opening half lots of argumentation about whether we should principally care or not care about these things as feminists and they kind of observe and you kind of do the thing where you say ah well like to be honest it doesn't really matter that much whether we do or do not care we probably side with our own bench and say no 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 feminists should like support like aggression in some in some circumstances or violence in some circumstances but even if you don't buy that and say no we should have a kind of general principled more of a principled obligation to be pacifist uh, it is nonetheless the case that this is an area for contestation and debate that has not been cleanly resolved. So our extension will exist independently of that. Um, and so you make the claim, or they made the claim, which is effectively, uh, to be honest, what feminist movement's opinion of particular intervention is, is likely to be deeply irrelevant in the decision-making calculus of any country when it decides whether it will or won't intervene in a conflict uh, so it probably doesn't change much what happens on the ground in terms of these interventions whether these interventions are likely to be better or worse but they flip it and say so then the question is what will this policy significantly change and actually it's just gonna change the ability of the feminist movement to achieve other things that it cares about a lot more so and the, the sort of the analysis for this is, is, is effectively that, you know, people aren't going to, you know, if the feminist movement says, no, you should definitely not intervene to help this, you know, humanitarian intervention because you're not directly helping women and we're always opposed to violence. People are just going to be like, that seems a bit weird. Um, and I'll also just like, why is the feminist movement like campaigning to not intervene in this particular conflict as a woman's issue when it's more of an economic issue or something else issue? And basically, ordinary people are going to be turned off from the movement, which means we're going to have less buy-in to achieve other things that the feminist movement cares about and probably ought to care more about, according to these guys. So what you're able to do is position your extension in a world which says it doesn't really matter who wins top half of the debate because the real impacts lie in a clash that exists outside of that. And I think this is something that you can... You know, obviously you can impose this on quite high standard debates. This was a year's final after all. But equally, you can impose it on, you know, the more messy debates that you, you talk ask about in your question. I think a good way of winning an incredibly messy debate is by sticking yourself outside of it and being very clear. But also, if the mess all centers around one particular, um, one particular issue, then... Um, then it's important if all the mess centers around one issue then make your case about something that sits outside of that so i have another question 
I'd like to hear your opinion about the different strategies after breaking to semi-finals slash finals if you have the time. Ha, huh. well, the first thing I would say is, well, I don't know, generally, don't ask people from Cambridge how to do one and out rounds because you're better off asking Oxford or Glasgow. But like, uh, or Sydney, really, to be honest. Um, I, I, I do think though there are probably some slight differences in how you approach out rounds to how you approach in rounds. Often here is where you're going to be much more, um, particularly closing half teams, you're going to um, be often run a much narrower case. So if you consider recent Euros finals, um, then, you know, generally people don't win them by making four or five different arguments. Uh, they win them by making one or two pretty plausible arguments uh, and then just defending them to the absolute death. So, for example, the Warsaw final, not, well, the Warsaw final probably is a good example of this, of, of strategy winning a debate, but also winning a debate with more or less one argument, which is effectively saying any argument that prop can make about how it will be really useful for like, um, so the, the motion in the Warsaw Euros final was about making a publicly available database of metadata, which is the information on your phone that it doesn't say you, the, what the content of your phone call was, but it says a phone call was made from this number to this number and it lasted this duration of time uh, and the phone's GPS location was here to there type thing. Um, and the motion was like, make a publicly accessible database of all of this stuff. Um, and opening government ran a big case about how uh, this will be really useful for social activism because uh, people can link together and get this information and gather statistics and data and blah, blah, blah. And it will be really useful in that sense. Um, and opening up, I think, win the debate pretty it's a pretty resounding victory that it almost comes from about three lines, which is to say, uh, yes, but uh, if the sort of the good guys can have all of this information that you say is really useful for organizing protests, then it's probably also true that the, the sort of the bad guys, quote unquote, will also have access to this information and then we'll be able to use that to stop your protests or crack down on all of these things. And a kind of general argument that says like, all of this data, though it could be used for good things, can equally be used for bad things. And the bad people generally also have the infrastructure and the means to use this information, as well as the sort of will, I suppose, to use this information in bad ways. And so every benefit that prop uh, sort of claims in terms of organizing things, knowing where people are, all of that stuff, is literally symmetric to the bad guy also knowing where these things are. Um, and so that kind of argumentation, picking like the something that sounds pretty, certainly in the context of debating, sounds like a really powerful argument that large amounts of publicly accessible metadata would enable oppressive regimes to pinpoint people communicating through like non-official channels or dissenters or oppressed minorities, racial, religious, sexual, whatever, and crack down upon them. That is obviously a big impact um, that I think you can frame quite easily in terms of debating as being incredibly important. And so you just win by just saying that. And then I think it becomes very difficult for prop, prop to win. Uh, and similarly, it was relatively difficult for closing up. We basically made the same argument, but just with a, instead of using Egypt, they use Ireland as an example. Um, although I don't think that's an entirely bad strategy. I think the second kind of strategy to say in finals is like, I don't know, like, it obviously depends on who your judging panel is, but I think particularly in out rounds, people probably weigh slightly more the kind of, performative nature of, of debating and the rhetoric and things, particularly because you're not just, it's not just about winning, you know, taking more points or taking more speaks. It's not about the difference between a third and a second. It's does this team go through? Does this team not go through? So often the way judges approach judging these debates is thinking like, you know, let's decide which team was the best on their individual benches. 
can we justify reasons why this one team loses to this team and this team? Also, often the way these discussions are structured is people will do things like they'll ask everyone for a general call, um, or they will say things like, um, you know, judging panel, can we go through any teams that we think are definitely in, any teams we think are definitely out? And so often just like having really great style and like telling lots of jokes and arguments that sound at the superficial level to be incredibly important and just kind of trigger those bells in the judge's mind, like this team is really strong and probably should be in the discussion or like at the very least keep you in the discussion for a little longer, even if the arguments themselves are relatively flimsy. I think the inverse is also true, that if you just make really weird arguments that the judges just don't think, just that don't just pass that basic mental block of just plausibility, then you put yourself in a more difficult position. So argumentation wise, I think the main difference um, in, a, in an out round is probably that you're going to be making a smaller, particularly in finals, you're going to be making a more narrow case, argumentatively at least, especially if you're in closing half. Um, um, if you're in opening half, then in finals, you absolutely want to just resort to doing the basics incredibly well. Don't be especially clever. Every other team in the world's final is going to try and be especially clever. So, oh, every other team is going to, every other team in the final is going to try and come up with their one clever thing. So if you are opening half, just be, I have eight arguments, here is why. So the reparations for women are, um, debate was won by OG just because they explained everything incredibly clearly from step zero to therefore this is a good idea, just by saying, okay, argument number one, here are six ways in which we've harmed women historically and through to the present day. Argument number two, here is why giving them a load of money makes their situations a lot better Argument number three here is that, you know, given it's pragmatically useful, here is why it's principally justified. And I guess preceding all of that was a sensible model about this is, you know, how we're going to do this. And then the deputy it's here are more reasons why this is the only way it is a, we are able to help women in this manner. So just by dumping a huge quantity of material on the table in opening half is a good way to try and hedge against your, your, your closing half and to stay incredibly relevant in the debate as the discussion goes on. Because often in finals, people are going to be making these weird, wacky arguments about something and trying to narrow the debate to one thing they think they can win on. If you spread yourself incredibly broadly, um, then judges are judges who don't intuitively buy sort of closing ops wacky extension are going to default to thinking, okay, this team just had like 10 different arguments, all of which were pretty good, and they haven't been able all of which haven't been defeated. Therefore, I'm going to be more favorable to opening gun. I think it's also true if you watch things like um, the, the Dutch World's Final, the Mexico World's Final, both of these things I think are, are, are why OG won, won their respective debates, just by basically saying most of these sensible arguments in an incredibly logical and sensible way which meant that when other teams tried to do their like, ha ah, ha, this debate is about this one thing, if the judges don't intuitively buy it, then they're always gonna revert back to, to, the, to the opening half. Um, yeah, I'm not sure there's much else to say specifically about how to do well in out rounds. I guess in earlier out rounds, before you get to the final, when there's a question of two teams going through, you can do things like um, pick up on which are kind of, I would say only do this if you know what you're doing. Go into the room, if you go into the room thinking, you know, I think these two teams are very strong and there's us and then there's also a weak team, then, you know, know who your, your battles are against. I would say only do this if you know what you're doing because don't go into a room thinking, well, I guess the team in OO is just this random ESL team so we'll probably beat them and then not pay them any attention because then you'll probably lose to them. But if you have, you know, you've debated lots of the teams in the room before and you have a relatively decent understanding of roughly where you lie strength-wise relative to the other teams in the room, I think it is useful to prioritize 
the clashes against particular teams. I think it is perfectly fine in an out round to kind of aggressively go for a second and like kind of recognize, well, I guess we're probably going to lose to Glasgow A. So let's like go really aggressively on, you know, the other team opposite me and make sure I beat them. I think especially in out rounds, the team you're always going to be compared to most is the team opposite you. And if you do, if you, if the judges feel like you haven't beaten the team opposite you, it's going to be difficult for them to justify. It is going to be harder for them, sorry, to justify them. You know, if you're, if you're closing gov and they think you just lose resoundingly to closing op, um, then that is going to put you in a more difficult position. So always uh, relative to either open half team, sorry. So always make sure you go after the team opposite you but then also go aggressively after the team that you think is probably your direct competition. If you think there's one team that is weaker, then you can have spend less time responding to them uh, and more time responding to the team that is stronger. I also think this should be done in the context of the round. So if there's an incredibly strong team and they just completely cock the debate up and talk about something wildly irrelevant and they're just awful, then like, again, don't spend lots of time on them. Uh, explain that you're doing this and give some reasons why. But like, be pretty aggressive in framing yourself relative to other teams. Use all of the rhetorical tools you have at your disposal to kind of pull other judges' heartstrings. Just get yourself in that conversation, and then hopefully, when those things are, um, when they start voting and things, you'll have some people pretty passionately for or against you. So I think as uh, as out round discussions go on longer, often. After a while, judges kind of solidify themselves into particular camps of being like, I am the I think OG won this debate camp. And so getting those people on side to kind of keep arguing for you, I think is is useful. And you do that by being rhetorically powerful or being very reasonable or being very clear, whatever it is you think the judges are likely to like. And that's probably another chat for another day is, you know, looking at the outround panel and if you know things about the judges playing directly to their to, to the things you think those judges will find persuasive. And similarly, if you know the other teams in the round, sort of trying to predict the arguments and the ways in which they will argue and then how you respond to them. Um, but I think this is all like, you know, the kind of thing that is relevant to not that many people in debating, the sort of like, well, you know, we've debated against this team six times already, so how do we beat them if we come up against them in an out round? Your best bet is to just do all the things you would normally do in an in round, to not change your style dramatically, uh, but to just be extra careful that you're very on clash in everything and that you're very clear and you aren't just making any silly mistakes that will allow judges to just be like, well, I guess they just didn't respond to the other team, so I can't justify them, them, them going through that. So... Um, I think that's probably the main set of things I was going to talk about. Um, I don't think anyone else has any questions. If anyone else has any questions in the like, I don't know what the time delay is between me saying these words and things appearing on the chat. If anyone has any further questions, then we can discuss them. Other than that, no, wonderful. In which case, uh, thank you everyone for watching. Um, I hope you found this at least somewhat useful, although I recognize it was a bit stream of consciousness. I would recommend there are some other um, videos on the training platform that go into more specific depth about any one of these particular issues. There's a really good uh, opening half strategy, um, uh, opening half strategy video by Ashish. And then Michael has done a, a really good framing one. So do look at the other things as well on this training platform, um, particularly the videos from like a year ago that you might have forgotten about. Um, but other than that, uh, thank you everyone for watching and good luck at Euros and in all your future debating things to come. <laughs>